Now, let's go ahead and introduce, uh, introduce our speakers. So, I want you all to, in a, in a minute, I'll, we'll, we'll do the applause, but meet Anna and, and Cassie, the dynamic duo from GitWit, a product development, Tulsa, product development and marketing agency in Tulsa. My eyes just like skip to the next line there. Uh, Anna is a seasoned pro with over a decade ex of experience leading GitWit's discovery team. She's conducted numerous customer and user interviews, bringing her insights to the table, backed by an MBA from the University of Arkansas. And Cassie, on the other hand, comes from an investigative journalism background, bringing her unique interviewing skills to the world of market research. So together, they're here to share the secrets of the discovery interview, a powerful tool for unearthing insights that drive innovation. Join them to learn how to define learning goals, ask better questions, and interpret the knowledge you gain. On a personal level, I, this, this jives very well with me because this is a lot of stuff that I do at my job as well. So I'm incredibly interested to hear this. Everyone, let's raise the roof for Anna and Cassie. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yeah. All right, I'm going to set my timer so I don't go over. All right. We just tested this and it worked, so hopefully. <laughs> Well, we're Anna and Cassie. I think, uh, yeah, we got a lovely introduction, so thank you so much. Oh, oh. sure. Yeah. Here, I'll um, let you sure. So, who here has heard about GitWit? We always kind of wonder when we go out of Tulsa. Okay, awesome. So, like a handful of people. Um, for those of you that haven't, GitWit is about a 40 person shop in Tulsa down the road. Um, and we really have the full team needed to do zero to one. Um, innovation. So that's kind of what the company is structured as, is to have upfront discovery. So that's what Cassie and I do, is research, interviews, figure out a good problem to solve, understand the industry that we're in, um, figure out, validate solutions, build strategies, things like that. And then we have a full product team. So product managers, UX strategists, UX research, um, and of course developers to really build out that solution prototype and then and do full apps and, and builds. And then a marketing team that then brings that into the world. So figures out the story to tell about this product and make sure that we get you know, users and customers and people buying it and talking about it and excited about it. So that's GitWit. Um, so yeah, reach out if, if there's any way that we can ever help with uh, yeah, any of your needs. But um, a lot of what we talk about is at GitWit, we try to find product market fit um, and that comes from really, am I close enough? No. I'm going to give one to you too. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> to, find, to find product market fit, we've got to make sure that we're finding the right problem to solve. It's easy to start with solutions. That's kind of the way that our society is built. Um, but it's really important to stay grounded in finding the right problem to solve first. So if you understand the core problem that you're solving, oh, well. For your users, well, sorry, we'll pause. Don't, don't touch. Don't touch it. <laughs> so we'll stay on this slide forever, I guess. Uh, okay. Don't touch. <laughs> um, yeah. So starting out, we have to find the right problem because understanding the problem that you're really solving for users and customers allows you to make strategic decisions. Then, when you're building and designing the product. It helps you to prioritize what is really going to address that root cause that we're <laughs> no, that we're trying to solve, I guess, okay. Um, what's going to best address that root cause? And then <laughs> um, how can we make the highest impact for our users and customers? It's tricky. So, so today we're going to talk about techniques and ways to really take a problem-focused fo problem approach to finding the issue that your users and customers are having, and then validating your solution through the lens of you know, a problem-first approach. But before we get into that, um, we'll give a little bit of an overview of kind of the purpose and the power of a discovery interview. 
So there is a whole spectrum of possible research methodologies, kind of ranging from the quant side, where we have experiments and surveys, over to the qual side with interviews and ethnography. Um, when you're over on the experiment side of the spectrum, it's really about removing context. So it's really about isolating variables and testing hypotheses and trying to get as sort of um, clean and straightforward of a validation or invalidation of a specific hypothesis. Obviously a very powerful methodology, experiments and surveys both, um, but they tend to be more about confirmation versus identifying new insights. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, you have ethnography, which is really all about fully immersing yourself in the context. It's about sitting with somebody while they're working and seeing all of the dynamics, seeing the phone calls that are coming in while they're sitting in front of their computer interacting with the software, you know, following them through their day and really understanding how your solution or how, you know, the area that you're exploring interacts with all of the different aspects of their life and their day. Um, so interviews fall closer to that right-hand side of the spectrum where it's really about surfacing new findings. It's uncovering something that you never thought that you would discover when you went into this research. And it's a very powerful tool. It's a very convenient tool. Getting somebody for 30 minutes or an hour is usually pretty reasonable, but it can also be incredibly insightful and powerful. So one thing is doing interviews in the development process or, or in the upfront product exploration process isn't uncommon. But one thing that we tend to see is a lot of people take a solution first approach rather than a problem first approach. And part of that is, well, our society. Um, you know, from grade school you're taught that having the right answer and having a good solution is the best way. Um, asking questions can make you look naive or ignorant. So people don't always like to have this I don't know what I'm talking about uh, sort of mindset. But also, especially in the venture world, it's really all structured about having a good idea first. So a founder you know, has to have this idea, then they have to go out and talk to people about it, sell it pretty hard you know, to get that funding to even get off the ground. So it becomes just about selling and persuading and convincing people of the solution right out the gates. Then they get funding. So then maybe they can really start building something and, and selling it to customers, but then again, you're selling it. You're trying to convince customers that this is the right thing. This is gonna solve their problem. And you're still making a lot of just hypotheses about what that problem is. It's only really then kind of, you know, maybe months or a year in that you start being able to say, is this really the core problem? Am I really understanding kind of the root, the root cause here? Um, and a lot of, you know, ideas don't even make it that far. So it's really important to take the time to understand the problem first. Because it's hard to do good discovery in selling mode. Um, so selling mode is you know, kind of the mindset that that whole you know, journey that we typically see puts people in. But it's at odds with more of a scientific mode, which is where the best discovery is done. When you're in selling mode, you're, you're in front of people, you're trying to convince them that your idea is right, you put people in sort of a mindset of, okay, I want to agree with you. Most people want to be agreeable. It's human nature. They want to support your idea. They, you know, especially if they know you, they want to encourage you. And you tend to have this mindset of just naturally being a little bit dismissive of things that conflict with your hypotheses and your solution. Versus when you're in scientist mode, that's when you're really going in to figure out all the ways that you're wrong. It's going into and saying, in what ways might my assumptions be incorrect? And you invite people, I intentionally in these interviews will ask people, please disagree with us. You know, you're actually gonna hurt our feelings if you agree with everything we say. We wanna hear all the ways that you think that we're wrong or all of the assumptions or all of the little nuances. You're digging in to really invite somebody to share their different perspective. And changing the context from more of a selling, solution-driven approach to more of a discovery interview, a scientific um, conversation, puts people in a totally different mindset. When you're inviting them to disagree with you, they become more of a, like a collaborator. It's like we're working together to figure out how your assumptions might be wrong and to refine this idea and to dig into this problem. And it puts people at ease as well. Because everybody, you know, when you feel sold to, um, you know, that's a certain mindset and, and you, you know, are a little bit more, yeah, you're less likely to, to be really honest and vulnerable and provide really candid feedback. So building rapport and telling people, inviting them to disagree 
is one of the most important aspects of a good discovery interview. So if you take nothing else away, it's just having that mindset of I'm trying to disconnect from this solution, even if it's something that I've come up with myself. I'm trying to really invite people to show me all of the weaknesses or potential issues with it. And I'm really gonna go in with the mindset of a scientist to try to figure out how this could be better. So now that we kind of talked about, you know, where discovery interviews fit and sort of the spectrum of research methodology, we'll dig into some tactics that we use. And it's important to take a really intentional approach to interviews. It's easy to go in and say, okay, you know, we have conversations all day long. And especially if this is something that we've been working on for weeks, for months, this is something that we're deeply familiar with, to feel like I could just go in and have a ca casual conversation with somebody and get their thoughts on this. It feels like it wouldn't be a huge lift, especially if you're somebody who's comfortable having casual conversations. Um, but it's important that there really is a craft and a science behind having a really good interview. And it's really that methodology of investigation. So approaching these interviews with rigor is going to ensure that you ask the right questions in the right way and get the information out of them that is going to make it the most valuable use of your time and the interviewee's time, as well as just the most valuable for the development of your product. So we've got kind of four aspects of conducting a discovery interview that we'll take you through. First, it's determining the right questions to ask then crafting the discussion guide, which is kind of that tool that you use to ask those questions, then asking the right people in the right way, so sourcing people, coming up with people to interview, and then interpreting what you learn. So how do you then go and analyze and process all of this information that you've just gathered? And when you look at something like I just showed you, where it's one, two, three, four, it's easy to think of discovery as a very linear process, but it's actually quite the opposite. Um, discovery is incredibly nonlinear. You can bounce between those stages at any point. Um, so you may be analyzing an interview and realize, you know what, I have a new learning objective based on something that I learned from that interview. And you may go back and reshape your learning objectives. Or you may change the way you ask some questions because you're not getting exactly the information that you want out of it. So bouncing between all of those different phases throughout the process is, it's messy, but it's part of the journey of discovery. Okay, so the first part of that was asking the right questions. First of all, why does that even matter? Um, so this is a quote from Warren Berger's uh, More Beautiful Question, which is a great book if you really want to dig into why questions matter and how to ask good questions. Um, but as he says, you know, the only way you're going to get better answers is to ask better questions. Um, so we can't just jump to the answers, unfortunately. We have to really think through what is it we're trying to learn and ask the question that gets us there. And one of the most powerful tools to help us ask the right question is the discussion guide. I'm sure you know, any of you that have done interviews have built a discussion guide. It's, it's kind of the, the core tool in um, an interview process. And a discussion guide, it shouldn't be a script. In fact, it should really be kind of the opposite of a script. Um, it's a pretty, you know, forced interview if you're just reading through question after question and, you know, it doesn't put the person at ease and it causes you to miss the key follow-up question that's going to get to that deeper answer. But the process of developing a discussion guide is one of the most powerful things you can do. So thinking through, you know, what do you need to learn and how might we ask those questions in a really intentional way and likely in a collaborative way with the other people that you're defining your learning goals with. Um, helps you really take an intentional approach. And then, of course, if you blank out in the middle of the interview, you have this thing to fall back on and you can jump right back in. So it also helps with that. So we'll start at the top of you know, our discussion guide with the learning objectives. Um, so learning objectives aren't the questions that you're going to ask verbatim, but they are the goals, what you're hoping to get out of this interview. So it's really important before you just go in and start writing like a list of questions that you take the time to think about who am I talking to and what is most important for me to learn from this, for, to learn from them. So trying to hone in on maybe it's one learning objective, but probably no more than five or so. If we walk away and we've accomplished this, if we understand the barriers that they have, you know, when using this specific piece of the software or, you know, what is the most important feature out of these five features that we could go build, that would be success. You can't just ask them that out of the gate, but that's what you want to walk away with. So if you have those learning objectives right at the top, 
That means during the interview, you can say, okay, I've accomplished that. We're good there, we're good there. Okay, I need to dig in a little bit more on that one. It also allows you to stay really anchored in those goals as you go to write questions. Because um, a lot of times you're only gonna have 30 minutes to an hour with somebody, and so you can't always ask everything that you would wanna ask, so setting priorities is important. Um, so then, if once you have those core learning objectives, what we like to do is we'll run a question storm. So this is kind of like a brainstorm, um, but for questions. And a lot of times when people think of brainstorms, you're thinking about coming up with a bunch of different ideas and concepts. But you can also do that to come up with questions. And that's really getting people together, the you know, people that you're working with on this project, either virtually or in person, and you've got those um, learning objectives at the top, and then you come up with what are some different ways that we could try to achieve this? What are some different ways that we could elicit this information? Um, really just about eliciting a quantity and diversity of ideas during this session, and then you can go back and refine some of the language afterwards. Um, so at the end of this, we'll have a link, and we'll share some specific um, sort of takeaways and resources that you can use um, in your own discovery interviews. One of those is a question storm template. Uh, so this will just walk you through kind of here's the information that you would input before the session. You'd think through your background context, your learning objectives. You want to make sure everybody in the room doing this question storm has the same grounding. Um, and it'll have some blanks and it'll kind of take you through that. So um, you can be looking for that at the end. Um, but I'll now turn it over to Cassie and she'll talk through. Uh, Let's see. Yeah. Let's see if I can use this clicker here. Okay, so a lot of times what we're trying to get feedback on will include a concept idea or a feature idea that we want to get people's thoughts on. Um, so what we like to do in these cases is put some kind of visual aid in front of people to react to. It's just a good way to make it feel more concrete, more real to them. And at this point, your visual aid doesn't have to be super defined. It could be a quick sketch, it could be a pitch deck or a concept storyboard or you could even go full out and do a full clickable prototype. Um, but before we even show them our concept idea or our feature idea, we like to first get their feedback on the problem that our concept idea addresses. And the reason we do this is you can really learn so much about how someone will really feel about your concept without even showing it to them based on how they react to the problem you're trying to solve. If you show them the problem and they don't relate to it, they don't have it, you have a pretty good gauge on how they're gonna feel about your concept idea. Um, and this is also just a good way to invite them to articulate their problem in their own words and share their perspective with you if maybe that's not the problem they're actually having. So during this, again, like Anna man mentioned, um, we'll invite people to disagree with us and we really try to make them feel like they're doing us a favor by sharing their perspective. So I'm gonna walk you through a quick example of how we ran this process at Gitwit. Um, we were developing a concept idea that we called feedback, feedback Bot at the time. Um, and the idea is, is it would help people deliver and request feedback in the workplace. So first what we did is again, we walked them through our problem space that we thought we had identified. In this case, it was companies make huge investments in employee engagement, but it doesn't seem to be moving the needle. In fact, 65% of employees say they are not getting enough feedback. So we put this concept deck in front of people outside of our organization, and first we were like, okay, is this a problem you're actually having? If not, what is going on in your workplace? How do you feel about feedback? Um, and then after that, we put our solution in front of them. Again, at this point, your visual aid doesn't have to be super well-defined. We put a kind of a pitch deck in front of them. Um, at this point, we really just wanted to get feedback on, is this idea something you're really interested in before we started investing the time in developing it and figuring out how it would work? And as you're developing your discussion guide, it's important to keep in mind how you're posing questions. Um, we try to keep our questions pretty open-ended. It's not something people can just answer with a simple yes or no. 
a good question. It creates a dialogue and we also try to avoid leading questions. So phrasing questions in a way that kind of indicates that you're looking for a specific kind of answer. So that could look like, what makes your current software hard to use? And just by saying hard to use, you're already kind of indicating, hey, tell me something that's wrong with your software, even if that might not be a major pain point for you. Um, so a better version of this would be, walk me through how you process a loan using your current software. Tell me a little bit about what's working and what's not. So a little bit more open-ended, not as leading, can't really tell exactly what you're looking for, so probably get less biased answers this way. And then as you craft your discussion guide, start off with broader questions and then kind of narrow down and get more specific as you go. And the reason we do this is early on in the interview, this is really your only chance to get their feelings on their needs, their pain points completely unprompted. Um, once you plant a seed, it's really hard to undo it. So taking the opportunity to kind of just let them talk um, about things that are on their mind without kind of leading them in that direction can be really powerful. Um, an example of this is starting out, can you tell me a little bit about your experience with cryptocurrency? And then as you kind of get into the interview and get toward the end, you can really save your specific questions or your more difficult questions for then. Um, in this case, it's on a scale of one to five, how would you rate the importance of white glove service as it relates to cryptocurrency? So much more specific, you really wouldn't want to start a interview that way. Um, and this might seem kind of obvious, but we find it really helpful just to add an intro and some warm up questions at the beginning of our discussion guide. It kind of reminds us to take a second and pause um, kind of tell them a little bit about what we're trying to learn, why we're speaking to them, give them a little bit of context on our project. We'll ask them if we can record. Um, and we'll also throw in a couple of kind of easy conversational questions just to warm them up and get them more comfortable with us before we just dive in. Um, so it's a good chance to make them a little bit more comfortable and confident. Okay. So we have our discussion guide. Now it's time to jump into the interview. So I'm gonna go through a few tips here. Um, Anna mentioned this earlier, but it's so important to keep in mind that discussion guide is incredibly useful, but it's just that. It's a guide, it's not a script. The last thing you wanna feel like when you're conducting an interview is that you're reading off of a listed script. It's uncomfortable for you, it's uncomfortable for them, um, it just, it's, it feels unnatural. Um, so a good, conver or a good interview really should be conversational. It's a back and forth. You should be asking follow-up questions. Um, in fact, so many times our best insights are from those follow-up questions. So don't be afraid to, I guess, kind of go off your discussion guide and just go where the discussion leads you. Hey, and we like to use a third party to source our interview subjects. And it can be okay to talk to people you know sometimes, but like Anna was saying earlier, the people who know you in your immediate network, they tend to want to help you, agree with your ideas, and this can really bias the feedback that you ultimately get, and of course, then what you ultimately build. So we like to use userinterviews.com, um, we've had a lot of good luck with them. And it's not only good for getting someone outside of your network, but it's also a great way to really make sure that you're talking to people who fit your target persona. You can go by title here, demographics, et cetera. Um, it sounds like this is a paid sponsorship, but it's not. <laughs> we just had a lot of luck with this. Um, it's about $200 or less for B2B interviews and about half of that for B2C. It's a great resource. Um, and then I'll hit on this a couple more times, but we record every interview we do. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, the first part is, is it just really helps with active listening. When you're trying to like make sure you write everything down or type quickly, it can get, you, you lose that engagement with the person you're talking to. You might miss some of those great follow-up questions you could ask. 
And it's also helpful to have for, um, after we record all of our interviews, we'll actually go back and listen to each one. Um, even if you're conducting the interview, it's really surprising how much you'll actually catch the second time around that you didn't when you were initially conducting it. And then of course, we all wanna be accurate. It's really hard to get something incorrect, especially when you're in the weeds of those really specific details. It's nice to have a recording you can fall back on and make sure you're getting that all right. Yeah, and as you talk to people, you'll start spotting trends, you'll start seeing patterns, and your questions are gonna start getting more informed. So we actually like to revisit our discussion guide every two or three interviews, and we'll kind of make some edits on it, add some questions, reword some things. Again, as we learn more, we really start honing in on those specific things we need to dig into. Okay, so conducted all the interviews, now it's time to start analyzing all of these transcripts you have. So when I come out of the interview process, and sometimes we'll do like 10, 12, 20 more, <laughs> um, it can be really overwhelming having pages and pages of transcripts, notes, ideas, and it can also be really tempting to jump out of an interview, maybe it went really well, get with your team, you're all excited, start making decisions, but it's really important to take a step back and really take the time to carefully analyze everything you learned. Um, yeah, you're most likely to remember the things that support your perspective and worldview, so taking the time to objectively do this can be really powerful. So I'm gonna go over a few tips that we use to analyze our transcripts, including how we review every interview and then how we share our findings with the rest of our team. Okay, so like I said, we record every single interview we do. So after that, we'll actually use a transcription service to transcribe our interviews, and then we will go through each one and highlight the quotes that pertain to our learning objectives or are just a key insight. Um, we like to use rev.com, fireflies.ai, but there are a ton of transcription services out there that you can use. Um, and then by the end of this, you have also pages and pages of highlighted quotes. So it's kind of time to make sense of those as well. And I'll go through how we do this in a moment. But we'll actually take those quotes and we'll organize them into a spreadsheet to start really honing in on the themes and what matters the most. So I'm gonna show you an example of a spreadsheet. It's gonna look really crazy at first, but I'm gonna walk us through this. So what we'll do here is we actually, this is a Google Sheet, and we'll send you the template. Um, we have different tabs here underneath to categorize our insights by theme. So in this case, we have what makes the feedback hard. So within what makes feedback hard, we have different themes we heard around what does make the uh, feedback hard. So for example, we have conflict avoidance makes feedback hard. Damaged relationships make feedback hard. And within each of these columns, we'll pull uh, related quotes from our interviews and group them underneath. And as you can tell here, they're all different colors. We'll actually assign each interviewee we talk to a different color. Um, and the reason we do that is it kind of helps us determine, okay, how many people are actually speaking on this point? Is it the same person talking about it over and over again? Is it multiple people? And this helps us determine how much weight should we put into any given insight. Because if it's only one person, then it might not be as significant if six or seven people are talking about that. Um, and then as you saw, um, the spreadsheet might not be the most intuitive thing to share with the rest of your team. So after we have a spreadsheet, we like to create a brief or a slide deck that we'll then get together and kind of walk the rest of our team through. In this case, um, I have an example slide here. You can see that we put a headline to kind of capture the overall theme of what we had found. In this case, it was people worry about the political ramifications of delivering candid and constructive feedback. And then we put a summary of what we had learned underneath and then what we'll do is we'll actually pull direct quotes from our interviews to share with the rest of our team. 
And it's just a powerful way to make the story stick and to make sure it resonates with them. Okay, so went over a lot, uh, but to quickly review, oh, maybe? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so we went over asking better questions, taking a system, systematic, sorry, this is throwing me off, um, how to analyze your findings. There would be a really cool QR code here if I can get it to show up. Okay, <laughs> we're okay. back. Um, so at this QR code, if you're interested, you can download the templates that we reviewed today. Um, you will see our question storm canvas, and you'll also see a template for that spreadsheet I pulled up that we use to organize our quotes. Um, there's also pretty detailed questions with that spreadsheet that kind of dig into how to use it. And I'm gonna skip slides, but I have the QR code on the next slide. Um, yeah, again, um, if you're looking for how you can implement this process at your own place of work, yeah, feel free to download the resources. Um, really powerful way to kick off a discovery effort is to start at the beginning, hold a meeting to discuss and define your discovery learning objectives, and then, of course, reach out to us if we can help you out. Okay, any questions? Yes. Hmm. Oh, so if you get a, a bit of a lull in the interview um, where you've asked kind of your core questions and they've kind of stopped talking, it sounds like, how do you keep getting more out of them without just ending the interview? Is that okay? Um, I would say try to ask the same things you've asked in a totally different way. Um, that's one approach is that Sometimes when you phrase the same question in a different way or you ask at the end something that you asked in the beginning, you can get slightly different input that's valuable. Another thing would be to confirm. So like, so I heard you say earlier X, Y, Z. I just want to confirm, is there anything you would add to that? And you can kind of get people talking a little bit more. Um, you can get, at the end of an interview, you can get really pointed and like, okay, so I'm about to go off and build this. Is there anything that you would tell me to watch out for or keep in mind before I go do this? Or we're about to spend $500,000 building this product. Like, what should we know before we go make this? Is this a terrible mistake? Or are we doing, you know, so kind of, you can even introduce sort of provocative questions, I guess, at the end, because you don't have to worry about, you know, then like leading people. You just have to keep in mind that you did kind of lead them a little bit at the end, but it can still be valuable. Anything else? Yeah. Are your discoveries usually like a fixed time frame or do you like evaluate how much work goes into the project? Ooh. Um, so we do build each, oh, sorry. Um, is our, are our discovery efforts usually a fixed time frame or do we evaluate based on the size of the client, client or, yeah. Um, so we build separate project scopes for each thing. We don't really have like the out of the box discovery scope. Um, I will say, like, you know, typically a large, like, upfront problem, let's define a problem, let's test a concept, you know, that's usually a two to three month process. But the number of interviews that we do is largely based on how many target personas do we need to talk to. So do we have different user types that we need to talk to? Is the buyer different than the user? And so we need to get input on both sides. Um, so sometimes we're doing you know, six to eight interviews, and sometimes we're doing 20 to 30 interviews. So definitely different timelines, depending. And we do try to do ethnography when we can. Yeah. So how do you distribute the world, right? How do you, well, how does the process change? Whether in person versus whether mm. or not remote screen, you know, showing your face or not? Sure, yeah, yeah. So it's always tricky when somebody is like, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's no harm. I know. In a remote world, um, how does the process change when somebody's in person versus when they're remote on a screen on Zoom or whatever? 
Um, I will say it's hard when somebody is screen off virtual, you know, you're kind of talking into the void. Um, but we do do the majority of our interviews now virtually. Um, so it actually lends itself really well to that because they can share their screen. Um, we can see kind of what they're working on if we do want to kind of look at their software solution. But then also it's just, it's the same building rapport. You know, you have to maybe put a little bit more into that when it's virtual versus when somebody's sitting right there. Um, and then, yeah, building rapport, helping them understand. But yeah, user interviews, we can source people all over the country. And so, yeah, we do a lot of virtual interviews. Sorry, I've got a cough drop in my mouth and I now realize I'm talking around it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. That's, if you want to, yeah, feel free. But um, how do we deal with it when, you know, we're, our client already has a solution in their mind, um, and so they're maybe hesitant to go out and kind of start at the beginning? I would say that's something that we deal with all the time. Um, when people come with an idea, when they want to go build a product, they tend to have an idea of what that product would be. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of times it's starting to ask the questions that they can't answer. Um, so in our sales process is kind of where we have to do that is starting to probe around, okay, so what is the problem that you're solving? And it's very uncommon for them to really be able to concisely articulate, this is the problem that this solution solves. Um, another thing is just kind of building in saying, hey, okay, we're going to go just do a few interviews up front, and then if we go find something that really, you know, invites a different direction or different perspective, um, you know, once we have initial evidence, it can help somebody then think about, okay, maybe I need to go learn more about this. Um, also, just building in, like, UX research throughout the process can help kind of uncover little nuggets and insights that help steer the direction. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's something definitely a challenge that we face is that a lot of times people don't want to go back to the problem space. Um, but then at the same time, a lot of times they can't fully articulate why they're doing what they're doing, so. <laughs> Anything else? I know we're probably... Let's give it up one last time. <laughs>